Hi and welcome. I am sitting here on a Tuesday, a beautiful day with Mr. Adam Markell. And I'm going to give a little, a little brief overview about Adam. Welcome, Adam. Oh my goodness. It's so great to be here, Stephanie. Thanks for having me. So great to have you here. It is Stephanie. a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. A glorious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we met because I think it's kind of cool. So, all right. So the first thing I want to say is that Adam is dedicated to bringing more love into the world, mm. which I cannot wait to unpack with you. Adam is a recognized expert in professional and personal reinvention, a highly sought after keynote speaker, transformational leader, and business mentor. He guides individuals and businesses to capitalize on change and magnify their impact. After building a multi-million dollar law firm, Adam began, became CEO of one of the largest business and personal development training companies in the world, overseeing more than 100 million in sales. His unique expertise is in combining practical business tactics with accelerated learning strategies to embrace change, encourage innovation, and increase sales for people and organizations worldwide. Adam Markell inspires, empowers, and guides people to achieve massive and lasting personal and professional growth, whether it be as a keynote speaker, facilitating corporate workshops, or mentoring individuals. So, wow, that's a wow. lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot that I'm reading and I'm like, dang, I just gotta you know, get the whole thing out there. So is there anything, and I, I've listened to your podcast and I love this question that you ask people, is there mm. anything that we missed that you would just love people to know? Mm, yes, that's so cool to have that question turned on me. <laughs> oh, good. good. Yeah, actually. Um, well. There's so many things. I'll just pick one, which is that I am very, very, very happily married to my college sweetheart. And it's a lot of years at this point. We have four, four kids, four amazing and healthy, wonderful, independent mm -hmm. kids, which is, uh, they're not kids. They're, they're all young adults ranging in age from 27 on the high side to 19 on, on, on the baby side. And, um, yeah, we've just we've just loved that ride. We love being a parent. I've loved being a daddy. So, yeah. you know, more more than any other, oh. you know, quote role in my life that that has been my favorite role. So, oh, that I daddy love that. and husband, yeah. Yeah, it's such a privilege, right? I mean, oh. Yeah, today my kids are a little younger than yours. They're uh, five and nine, and today was crazy hair day at school. Crazy. So I sent my daughter off with two purple pigtails, and she loved it. She was rocking it, and kids have got like cupcake hair and a spider bun, and it's just it's just the best. It is. It's like we relive our our childhood on a, on a certain level and places where our parents may have not not shown up exactly how we would have envisioned them showing up. You know, I know mm -hmm. that's never the case, right? Uh, LOL. Um, yeah. but, uh, but where that was the case or, or, you know, that's our story anyway, as parents, we get that opportunity to do it again and mm -hmm. something really fun about that. Absolutely. And what better privilege than raising these amazing humans to make the world a better place. We need it. We always, yeah. you know, that that's the evolution of, of, humanity really is that each with each revolution there's a there's just a little bit of a changing of the guard i mean we're seeing it in politics we're seeing it in so many places right now mm -hmm. and um and that's just the natural it's the natural way of things the natural way of nature so nothing nothing unusual there really exactly embracing change and i want to take us back to since i've listened to your ted talk which by the way i encourage anyone listening to to check it out because it's it's so impactful i, I really enjoy how you started with just a story that just drew me in immediately and i was just i was in and you know we talk about change we're talking about change a little bit and the changing of the guard and and being a parent. And I would love to have you just tell us a little bit more about a time in your life where you felt the need to pivot. You talk about being this really successful lawyer. Tell us about what happened. Because I know there's a lot of people out there that I talk to who are in a similar situation to the one you were in. And I just want to hear your backstory a little bit. Yeah. Well, the, uh, I'll start with the word pain. 
<laughs> that's, a good, that's, that's a good hook, right? Let's Run. start this story with something that everybody can relate to, like pain. We're on yeah. Pain Island. We're on Pain, on Island, pain Island right Island. now. Yep. Let's hear it. So here I am. I'm, I'm, I am a lawyer, which there's a, a lot of story that leads up to that because I started out as a, a kid in, in college, not knowing what I wanted to do and lost or just looking looking for inspiration, not finding too much. I was an English major. I, I loved doing that. I loved being in college. College was great. Um, and But leaving as well, um, I just didn't have a lot of direction. Didn't quite know what I wanted to do. But I ended up going back to school and becoming a lawyer because it seemed like a good way for my then fiance and I to get going, get started. She knew she wanted to be a teacher. Her mom was a teacher. She knew that was her path. And, and I meet people from time to time who know that something is their path from really early on. And then some of those folks, they ride it all the way, all the way to, you know, sort of to retirement because they knew and, and they were settled. And I don't wanna say I envy folks like that, but I definitely, um, I look at them and I say, in my experience anyway, they're outside the bell curve. Those are, the, those are more the outliers. Mm -hmm. And because I do meet people too that, that thought that they wanted to do something and found that it was more their parents' intention more than their intention or it was their following in somebody else's footsteps that made sense, you know, uh, or they just, for whatever reason, they, they had seen a TV show or a movie or they got inspired when they were eight years old and they decided, oh, I'm gonna be a doctor or I'm gonna be an accountant, I'm gonna be a lawyer or whatever. You know? Um, and at the same time, I was, I don't even know, I was probably wanting to be a rock star <laughs> or a professional <laughs> basketball player, you know? And so you get to be 19 or 20, you go, okay, so I'm not seven feet tall. And when I quit playing, you know, taking my guitar lessons when I was 10, that sort of shot me in the foot for being a rock star. So you go, well, what else can you do? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I just went back into school, became a lawyer and fast forward sort of 18 years from there, I practiced law for 18 years and probably half of the time, maybe from about eight or nine years in, I started to uh, notice that things were changing inside of me, that, that I was not terribly enthusiastic about my work. I wasn't feeling great when I started the day. In fact, more often than not, when I'd start the day, I put my feet on the floor and I would feel sort of anxiousness. And I meet a lot of people that can relate to that, that they start the day going, ugh, you know, there's some, some ugh moment at the beginning. And for me, it, you know, ugh moments turn into more like anxiety or, or feeling dread yeah. at the beginning of the day and feeling even exhausted before the day even got going. So these were pretty good signs when I look back on it now. There's always signs of things of discontent or signs that maybe a change is coming or is necessary, is required. I just mm -hmm. wasn't, I wasn't really conscious of it too much then. I just figured I'm gonna work harder so I can retire sooner. You know, I'm just gonna make more money and then I'll be, then I'll be set. I'll, I'll have the, you know, the proverbial money that tells you you don't have to do what anybody else tells you to do or whatever. Right, right. Yeah, and that just was my plan because I didn't have a better plan until I ended up in the emergency room with my wife, Randy, right by my side, thinking I was having a heart attack one day on a Saturday. We were on the mm -hmm. way to our kids' baseball game. Talk about, you know, like, bizarro. I, uh, my, my, my chest was just, uh, it, it felt like I had, like somebody was punching me in the chest and my heart was racing so fast and I was sweating profusely and I ended up, telling Randy, I go, we got to get to the hospital. I don't even know what's going on with me, but just get me to the emergency room. And she's freaking out. And yeah. I'm now lying on a gurney and thinking I'm dying and I'm not going to see my kids that afternoon or ever again. And, uh, and it turned out to be the doctor said, look, you, you just like, you're way wound up, buddy. Like you're lots of coffee. You're in a mm -hmm. high stress job, life, you know, I got four kids and houses, cars, gerbils, goldfish, you got, you're responsible for a, whole, a lot, you know, and you're just, uh, you're having an anxiety attack probably. But, mm. and that's the good news. That's the good news, man. I don't always get to tell people that. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people come in here your age, if they have a heart attack, they kind of don't come out sometimes. So I left, I walked out of the hospital with, with Randy that day, looked up at the sky, I said, thank you. I said, 
I said, actually said, thank you, God. And I didn't say that very, uh, if at all, at that point in my life. So yeah, it was a big moment. It, it got my attention, you know? Yeah. Um, and we can dig into the details. It did, that's not the end of the beginning of the story, but it got my attention for the first time that something had to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so powerful and impactful. And, and I know for some listeners that are out there, they're probably in that boat right now. There's plenty of people who, regardless of how they got into a certain career, at some point, it's just the stress gets too much and the rat race gets too much and you're just so ready for this change, but you feel stuck, like you got yourself there. What are you even going to do next? So what started to happen for you? What changed to make such a big leap or pivot, as you say <laughs> in your book? <laughs> well, okay. So the good news is it had to get worse before it got better. Oh, great. Yeah. Isn't that always wonderful? So <laughs> yeah. we'll go into that. I'll just say I, came, I remember that even though I was aware that a change was required, I, yeah, I was still stuck in an old loop. Mm -hmm. We have these habit loops and very difficult to break without both awareness as well as some support and, uh, and, and all that kind of thing. So fast forward, maybe another five, six months, I had started thinking about, well, maybe I'll just reduce my commute and open an office closer to home, which I did do that. So we I was commuting from Jersey to Manhattan, open an office uh, only a few miles away from my home in New Jersey, so I could be there a couple of days a week. And that really did work for a while. That, that gave me a bit of a buffer space. Mm -hmm. um, but then one night, I had missed the kids, you know, come home. It was late. It was rainy. I walk in the door. I knew I, as soon as I saw Randy's face, I'm like, okay, great. I've, not only did I miss dinner, but I also missed the chance to get in bed, read a bedtime story, and cuddle and kiss. And, you know, just like all the things that... It, being a parent, that's the juice of it, right? When they're being a pain in the ass or they're driving you crazy or there's, you know, breaking things, right? Or, you know, you go, oh gosh, I can't believe I signed up for this. Mm -hmm. um, but the far more prevalent experience is that you just look at your kids and, and with wonder and you can't believe they're so, they're just so glorious. Like they're these divine little versions of you and your and your spouse and your grandparents and your great grandparents and all these people in your life, you know, in your in your lineage that you never even met. And it's all wrapped up in these little, these little amazing beings. But if you don't see them, if you don't spend that time with them, if they can't unwind their day in front, you know, to tell you and share with you, it's like, what's the point, right? Yeah. So I walk in, I had all that rush of emotion of regret and just self-loathing about missing them again. And I walked right up to Randy and I looked at her and I said, if I keep doing what I'm doing, you're going to be a widow. Oof. That's so heavy. It's heavy, right? Yeah. So, and you know, Randy, so what was yeah. really amazing is that rather than her remind me of just all that I had going on and what, what I was responsible for, um, you know, men have that. Well, I mean, look, it's a traditional role. It's not the role in everybody's home or in everybody's life. But for me, I was the provider. She worked, Randy worked, um, and, and provided plenty. I, but my role was to take care of the family and to, you know, all the, all the extras, all the stuff, you know, the, the dance recitals and the, everything they wanted to do was going to mm -hmm. be mine to take care of. So she, didn't, she just didn't remind me of any of that. Mm -hmm. She took a deep breath. And we both did. And I remember we, we just sort of held each other for a little bit. And she looked at me and she said, we'll figure it out. And that started a process that took about two and a half years where I was able to find through a process that we write about in this book that, that ultimately was you know, birthed from that experience, pretty excruciating experience at times. But I uh, wrote this book, Pivot, The Art and Science of Reinventing Your Career and Life. And it was a two and a half period where we built a plan B. So I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't scuttle my plan A. I didn't, you know, we didn't, we didn't pack up, sell the home and everything and move to Fiji or, you know, which again, I sometimes joke that would have been cool, but um, no, we, and we didn't double down either on, on that whole idea of I'll just, I'll just figure it out. Just work harder, faster, you know, like it's so many times, we know something's not working, but we keep doing it, thinking somehow if we do it differently or faster or better, you know, that it'll, it'll turn out differently. Um, 
but it doesn't. And that's what's insane in the process. So mm -hmm. we stopped the insanity and started to create this plan B. And that's ultimately what we were able to pull off, which is what the book and a lot of the te teaching or talking that I do with people these days of speaking is about that. So. Yeah, exactly. And just having you know, met Randy, and I'll just say a little bit about how we met, is uh, through yoga. Just, I teach yoga, and I just to kind of diverge and come back a little bit, one thing I really noticed when I took over this class and I saw you and Randy coming in is just how you were up front. You were at the front of the class. And I don't judge. If people want to be at the, it's a really big yoga space. <laughs> and if people want to be at the back of the room, I get it. You've had a long day. You don't want to be bothered. You just want to take your yoga and kind of be like just in the background. I totally get it. But there's something just that was so unique about the two of you just showing up right in the front. One thing that I've really heard just being part of the coaching communities is how important, you know, successful people they are, they're, they're right up front, they're right up front. And uh, you'd have these t-shirts on that would say love or resilience. I'm like, I like that t-shirt. So we started chatting and just getting to know the two of you. I could just see how supportive Randy is and has been in that process. And what is, if someone's in this zone that you were in back then, like, people I think can feel really helpless or that nothing's going to change and they want it to change. And they know that if you keep on that gerbil wheel, you're just going to keep getting the same results. So what is like a first step when you don't know what you're going to do next, when you just feel like this cannot continue, like what's a first step for people? It's such a great question because a lot of, a lot of what we tell ourselves or has, or it's been told to us that we've got to, to create a big change, we've got to take a big step. So if you want to transform your life in some way or your business in some way, or your career in some way, then you've got to do something that's transformative, you know? Yeah. And that's, and I'm going to call BS on that because it's just not the case. Mm -hmm. um, for me and, and for a lot of other people, having done a lot of research on this now, it, it, there's really a couple of things um, that are fundamental. One is that you understand how to take small actions but meaningful actions, not insignificant things, but, but small incremental steps are what changes things dramatically over time. It's the compounding effect. It's the law of small differences. It's the butterfly effect. It's the idea that in physics, you can't change an input without the output changing. There's science behind it. It's not just woo-woo stuff. It's not just personal development. Not that there's a just anything. I mean, our personal development is everything in life. But people sometimes want something that's really tangible and that they can, you know, sort of sink their teeth into and go, well, if I do this, then I, then what I can expect is that. And, and I'm a lawyer, so I, I'm, I'm cool with logic, you know, the premises of if this, then that. So, so I get that. Mm -hmm. um, small change is a big one. We can talk about what small changes looks like. And, and the other one is resilience. So when I, when I wrote the book, Pivot, uh, resilience was a chapter within the book. Because in my experience, a part of my successful pivot, and it's not one and done, by the way, I'll, I'll share something in a minute about that, but um, to successfully pivot, you must, you must be resilient. And resilience is a, is a key, it's, it's an ingredient inside the pie that we'll call change. Um, years later now, the book is a couple of years uh, out there, and it's been a big bestseller, it's been you know, wonderfully received, which was you know, something not so unexpected, I guess, but just um, it's, it's always a, a really wonderful surprise even to find that people have read it and then got something lastingly positive from it. That, mm -hmm. that always just blows me away. And, and I have this just tremendous um, gratitude for, for the power of books. And I'm, I'm a reader and I'm, you know, just see, see how my life changes when I've read great things. So um in the book, it was a resilience was a chapter. Now, what I know is that resilience today for me is the book, and pivot. The principles of pivot are a chapter within the bigger book, which I today find to be resilience. That this is this is more often um, to to succeed or to um, just in, enjoy to experience joy on a on a regular basis, daily basis, in any area of our lives, we, we have to be resilient. 
Mm-hmm. And, and it means a lot of things. It's not just one thing. Um, but more and more, if I think of a trait that, or a, or a skill set, a, a, a tool that I'd want our kids to have forever, it would yeah. be the tool or the skill of resilience. Because with that, we, we get to learn and we get to experience and we get to be living out, outside of a zone of, of fear and worry and just enjoying life while life is is constantly moving and while we're constantly evolving and so it's it's a funny thing because these days our team will sometimes we'll draw two circles and one's a circle with pivot one's a circle with resilience and then there's this you know this then diagram right. where they overlap right but uh but yeah so um so the the question hopefully i'm answering is that you start with a small step right and, and that small step might just be awareness to begin with and there's no, this, mm-hmm. that's a key step not to be overlooked. Um, and, and so if the awareness allows you to shift in some way a perception of what's, what you're looking for, so meaning if you get up every day and you realize you're not actually working in, your, in the area of your genius or you're not working in the place where you feel passion or you're not working in the, in the zone where you feel in full integrity, mm-hmm. these are good signs that long-term, that's not necessarily where you are called to be. And, and it's not any different than the seasons. Like we're in this beautiful season of winter here in Southern California, right? which is, is like the most beautiful thing in the world. Um, but I lived more than 40 years on the other coast where winter was also beautiful, but in a very different way. And we're freezing rain and, mm-hmm. <laughs> and beautiful snow and lots of other things were, were also present. Um, and, and people would long for the spring. I remember living on that coast and just longing. I mean, any sign of spring was just like a harbinger of life. You know, we're going to, we're going to get to live again. I get to come outside. I get to take off all these heavy clothes and, and just, you know, that's right. Get my skin, you know, um, browned up, but, uh, we, we live, we live and we have these seasons of life. And Stephanie, you must, you must appreciate this all the time, right? How, how in yoga, different poses, for example, um, they're, they're, you hold them for a period to, to gain some juice out of that, out of that position. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then you release them, you let them go and you move into a different position. Why should our, our job or our career or our lives be any different than in yoga? Exactly. Yeah, there's so much to take off the mat too. And this is like 100% I'm on the same train with you about all of this, like that awareness. That's what we cultivate in yoga on the mat. That, that's, that's the whole reason, really. The whole reason is to be able to observe the mind, to get to that place at the end where we observe the, the mind, we observe the highs and lows, and we observe what's going on. Because the more we know ourselves, the more that we can make these pivots. That's like one of the first things that I help people with in my coaching and my workshops too, is to, to one, ask the question, what do you really want? <laughs> Even if it's just in this moment and then making a commitment to themselves, making a commitment to yourself, even if that's for like the next minute, for the next 20, you know, some people are dealing with perhaps addictive behavior or they're just in a really low place. So what can you commit? What do you want? What do you want for these next 20 minutes, for this next hour and including the mindset? So I am like 100% on the same train with you about creating that awareness and, yeah. and even with having little kids, I was thinking about when you were talking, when the kids are really little and they're waking up a lot. And you know what I used to do? I would wake up and I'd be like, okay, today's in, or, or there's like these tantrums and you've had this huge mm-hmm. tantrum day and then, and you just wake up and you're like, okay, this is a new day. The sun is out <laughs> here <laughs> or it's whatever. You just like reset. And I think about how I slept, I reset you know, and I'm just going to start fresh or even being married with my husband. You know, maybe we had an argument like, okay, today's a new day. I'm just going to clear that slate. This is us today. You just reset. You don't have to be wherever you were the day before. So yeah, yeah. it's so true that it, that a happy new day, you know, to wake up, like we say, happy new year. Yeah. Have a happy new day. I love it. Can you make a it's, t-shirt that says happy new day? A happy new day, t-shirt. right? Yeah. I know, it's so funny. This is, well, what, what if we could take our lives 
in 30 minute increments. What, mm -hmm. what could you commit to by way of your attitude, your energy, your intention, your, your, your attention, your focus for just 30 minutes? Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting because we sometimes do a process in one of our, so we, we train people to do public speaking, usually get on TED stages and create uh, keynote speaking, uh, keynote talks to, to speak publicly. And um, we sometimes do an exercise where we'll walk them out in a beautiful place, sometimes at the beach, and, and just sort of give them this context of what if this was the last 30 minutes? And what would, it, what would you be thinking about? What would you be wanting to do, but you don't have now the time to do it? Would you get on your phone? Would you be texting people? Would, you know, what if you just were present? with yourself right. for those 30 minutes, those last 30 minutes and, and what would come up for you, et cetera. And it really is a profound exercise because it, it, it has us really thinking and feeling into just being, just being and, and what feels right and what feels good in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think when it comes to making a change, uh, the, the idea, the awareness that something, as you, as you put it, that, that there's something you want that's different than what you're mm -hmm. feeling in the moment or experiencing the moment is a massive shift for starters. And, mm -hmm. and to give that some additional energy or put it, create momentum from it, um, to me, we've got to have actions that we take and, and the word we use for those is rituals because we're so, we're so habitualized already. So many of the things that we're doing, we're doing without thinking about it. We react to things. We get angry. You get triggered by things. We brush our teeth with the same hand. I mean, we drive home in the same direction. I mean, it's like we get into a yoga studio and we're habitually either going to go to the front or we're going to sit somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all that kind of thing. You go into a room of strangers and you habitually either move toward the, the energy in the space and, and want to engage people or habitually you kind of shy away or stay on this, you know, on the outskirts. And, and it's not, and there's no judgment around that. It's just that we're such creatures of those, those unconscious ways of being. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you look to ritualize something to intentionally consciously create something new, uh, then, then it's, things will change gradually and so when it comes to what do you do back to that question of when if you're if you're not loving some part of your life which was the ted talk i gave was about loving your life mm -hmm. then you start with some small step and you build from that new ritual whatever that might be and and it could be that that ritual is to to be able to create a new beginning of the day the way you start the day, the first thoughts or the first things you say during the day. Um, developing those rituals produce a great deal of resilience in you because in all of us, because you're now doing something that, that will really be building up your mental, emotional, physical, and, and spiritual well-being. And it could be that it's that instead of watching the news, let's say, before bed, as some people do, or at other points in the day, that you're you're reading something instead, or you're taking a walk out in the evening air. I mean, there's so many different things that can be these sort of micro pivots or micro changes that you can employ. And yoga was one of those things. So where you and Randy and I met was one of our rituals that we had created, which was that we were going to go to yoga because we love doing it. And mm -hmm. so we weren't going to just talk about loving doing it, but we we're going to actually do it. And then we wanted to do it together. Yeah. And that's where we met you, which was yeah. so. so perfect. Yeah. And what I love about what you're saying is in terms of creating these rituals, it's, it's, we have rituals all the time. We don't even think about like wake up, look at the phone, look at the email. As soon as you wake up, it's sort of more mind less than mindful or in the car thinking about all sorts of things or I hate to say it, you know, people are checking text messages or whatever, you know, that might be. So there's these things or the, what we decide to eat or drink or three cups of coffee later, you know, it's like comfort. Some of it's very com com comfortable where we choose to be in a room. But if we take that moment, that ritual before we enter that space, or, um, you know, I think about before I teach that yoga class or 
when we wake up before we reach for that phone, create a new ritual that best serves us. What I hear you saying is it's a ritual that's going to best serve your highest good. It's a ritual that's going to best serve the mindset that you do want. It's going to best serve the change that you do want to make. So like, what are some rituals that, and you talked about yoga, what are some other rituals that you love? I, I love I am statements. And, mm -hmm. and um, what I mean by that is we're constantly creating our identity by the words that we use. So the language that we, that we apply to ourselves becomes who we, you know, the person that we are. And so um, I'm really conscious of the things I say after the words I am or I'm, you know, like I'm sick. If you say I'm sick, what is that? What, what, what exactly is that that you're putting out, not just putting out into the universe, da, 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 but actually embodying. Yeah. And so the, those I am statements are a really powerful tool. So one of those small changes would be to create a list of a few I am statements that represent the identity that you, you want to embody. Mm -hmm. So for example, if what you want to do is lose some weight or become healthier or um, live longer. I mean, there are things that you can say, so I, I am someone that eats like, or, or takes care of myself like an Olympic athlete. I am, I am a world-class and then fill in the blank. Um, you can create an I am statement that will help to, to embody, help you to embody an identity of the kind of person that would, that would routinely do things that, that you see someone who is successful doing those things. So if, if mm -hmm. again, if you say, I am not a morning person, and we know that the people that get things done, I, I don't love the word success, so I'm coming to just tug of warring that in my head right now, but mm. because it's just, it means a lot to a lot of people and it's a bit watered down, but there are mm. things that you want, let's say, and, or that you see someone else is doing something that you respect and you want to do something like that. Well, to get more of that happening in your life, there's a good chance that you've got to do some things that you might be uncomfortable doing at the moment. Mm -hmm. It might require more time in the morning. Um, so if, if what you want to do is experience, I want to be peaceful. I am, instead of I am stressed out and what you really want to own is the I am statement that I am peaceful. I am calm. I am serene. I am, I am unconditionally loving, what, whatever it might be. Well, then those I am statements are a lie if, if what you're not, if, if you're not prepared to, um, well, two things. One is if you say that in, in a moment of, of, of being more conscious that I am peaceful, like in yoga class, if you say I am peaceful and then the next day or at some other point, somebody asks you how you're doing, you say I'm stressed. Well, then it's like you're building something and tearing it down, building and tearing down, which I think a lot of people do is they put their foot on the gas with one foot and then they put their foot on the brake and this constant toggling back and forth between the gas and the brake sort of creates a go nowhere energy. Mm -hmm. It's telling the universe, you know, I'm starting, I'm stopping, I'm starting, I'm stopping, building, wrecking, building, tearing down. So got to be really conscious of that language and then create these I am statements and live into them. And by live into them, I mean that you, you, so if I say I am, I am peaceful, then you're, you're saying to yourself, well, if I get up at eight o'clock in the morning and I've got so much to do before I have to leave the house at 845, how can I possibly be peaceful mm -hmm. in that case? So even though I say I am peaceful, it's just like I've got all this stress around me. I don't feel peaceful. But if you got up at seven o'clock in the morning and you had an extra hour to meditate, to be still, <clears throat> to enjoy some tea or whatever it is, you know, would just, you'd embody what feels like peace to you. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you have congruence between the statement that you're making and the things that you're willing to do, but you won't do that. I know we're getting complicated, you know, sort of in the, in the weeds a little bit here, but if you say, I'm not a morning person, I'm not good in the morning, I'm not getting enough sleep or any of those kinds of things, they sort of just, they stack upon one another. 
And then you ultimately mm -hmm. are building and wrecking as opposed to going, I am peaceful mm -hmm. and I am a morning person and I'm a morning person because that helps me to be peaceful because now I'm not rushing any place. And so it really, in, in, in essence, I would say for, for people that want to want to see a change, this, this, there's the idea of sort of mapping out what those I am statements are mm -hmm. and then unpacking the statements. So you don't just say them like a parrot that's given something to repeat, like an affirmation or a declaration, like a lot of people do, and they just parrot this thing and they go, well, look at me. I, you know, I can say I am loving and kind. And then, you know, 20 minutes later, they're stuck at a red light and someone's texting on the phone in front of them and they lean on their freaking horn. Mm -hmm. Or that person gives them the finger and they're quick to give them right, you know, flipping the bird right back. And you go, oh, but I thought you were peaceful and kind. Yeah. Right. You know, so it's that building and wrecking thing. It's a problem. And, and the other thing, and maybe the last thing I'll share about this is just that for us, when we were building our plan B over two and a half years, we have a home on the East Coast on the Cape. And, um, and it's on this island and there's a lot of you know, little waterways and things you drive over. And, and one of them has a drawbridge. So we're driving over this drawbridge and we saw that they were building something. So we pulled over and I asked Army Corps of Engineers person what they were building. And they said, well, this bridge is likely not to survive another storm. You know, that's a whole metaphor of its own, right? But it's like, mm -hmm. okay, so they're building another bridge because this one might go down in the next storm. And I thought, okay, great pivot story, right? Because they didn't tear down the first bridge. Mm -hmm. That bridge, we were still driving over that bridge as they were mm -hmm. building the second one. I thought, okay, so this is classic pivot <laughs> stuff right here. Don't tear down the first bridge before you have another bridge built. So but, perfect. So perfect, right? Yeah. But like two years later, they were done with that project. We're driving over the new bridge and we see them building again. So we pull over and go, what the heck is going on? <laughs> I mean, it's like multi millions of dollars, right? <laughs> years and years going on. And the guy goes, yeah, you know, uh, the, um, it's always been the plan that the bridge we were building was a temporary. Bridge. Oh my gosh. I mean, freaking out, right? You go, okay, so now what are you doing? They go, we're building now the quote permanent bridge, the hundred year mm -hmm, bridge mm -hmm. that can survive any nor'easter, blah, blah, blah. And so they built that bridge and then they tore down the temporary bridge. And that's the thing about pivots. That's the thing mm -hmm. about the changes that we make in our lives and these seasons that we go through. Just don't expect it to be, I mean, I'm not saying it can't last forever, yeah. But my expectation is that it's a season. Right. You, you build this bridge and it may be temporary and then you build another one and that one becomes a little bit more permanent perhaps. Um, and then you just, and then of course you're allowed for, for just life to unfold and you know, we're never given any, any challenge. We are not, that we're not capable of handling. That's I, just the belief system I have about the things right. that we deal with. Yeah. And it sounds like it's a lot of trust and a lot of surrender, you know, in that situation with the bridge, it's very clear. Like we, we know clearly they're going to make this temporary bridge and then they're going to have the permanent one. But in our situations that we're talking about, when you come up with this mindset thing, like I am peaceful, we have to trust into that. We have to trust into that process and know that as we create that new sort of record playing in our head as we create that new thought process. And I would imagine we're, we're, um, oh, what's the right word? We're just um, kind with ourselves when we fall off of that and we lay on the horn or we say some spirit, swear words and we allow ourselves. It's like watching a kid learning to walk. Like we know that kid's going to walk. We can see it. Like clearly in most cases it's going to happen, but that kid just goes through the process and they fall down and we're like, we're not like, oh my gosh, they're never going to walk now because they fell down one time. We're just, right. we just- You never look at your kid. The worst parent on the planet never looks at their kid when they're a year and a, a little, you know, like a year old or whatever and goes, sees a kid falling all over the place and goes, that idiot, that kid will yeah. never walk. Right. We never do that. So it's never. just for ourselves. Like it's trusting. And I, you know, everyone has different belief systems, but I really do believe that we, we have a purpose. Like we're given our gifts for a purpose. And you may find that as a journey throughout your life. You may be that person who knows it when you're two years old, you're going to become a doctor. Or you may that be that person who has to pivot a few times. And we don't have to look at it like, like just look at it as kind of normal, like kind of normalize it a bit. Like, oh, cool, you get to pivot now. 
Awesome. Let's see what you got next. I mean, look at you. You went from a lawyer to being this amazing person serving the world by spreading love. I mean, what if you'd been so afraid you stayed with that, you know? And, and so I just, I'm so grateful that you trusted and that you were, you surrendered and were able to do it. So hmm. tell us a little bit more about resilience because clearly <laughs> To pivot requires a lot of resilience to be that little kid who falls down and gets back up to walk again with my kid had so many bumps on his forehead. Oh, it's so <laughs> you know? true, right? Yeah. Yeah. We all have those bumps, those, those bruises and things. And so the, the, the down and dirty on, on resilience from our research is that there are some traits that, that people have who are that are resilient, hmm. define themselves, say, I am resilient. In fact, I have a shirt that says I am resilient because again, it's one of those, it's one of those I am statements that I want to, I, I want to yeah. be resilient. I don't, I don't want to get knocked down. Like you, you look at a willow tree and it bends in the wind. It's just the most beautiful thing. And sometimes the strongest oaks, these really solid trees, man, as soon as the wind blows, the branches are all on the ground and sometimes they get uprooted and, and I see, you know, there's a lot of people that, that go through that and, I, and I've been uprooted. So I know what that feels like as well. And, and it's, it's, I don't believe what our, our greatest purpose in being on this, in this life is to be, to continue to be for however long it is that we're, we're given to be. So being uprooted by a bankruptcy or uprooted by a divorce mm -hmm. or uprooted by an addiction or uprooted by a shitty job or, or, a, or just whatever, frustration with not making it, that's just too small. It's, it's not even, it doesn't even rate. It's not a storm in the, in the grand scheme of things that, would, that should interfere with our being, which is our main purpose. Mm -hmm. So um, resilience traits anyway, the ones that we see that, that are not only things that some people, uh, you know, think it's like you're born with it and that's not our experience and that's not what our, the research says either. It's, these are things we learn and we develop over time. So one of them is the ability to reframe. So the first one is how do you take a look at situations that are going on right now in your life and frame them, not through rose colored glasses, but to see the creative opportunities in them. To be able to, to see that there's meaning and purpose even in, in a shitty situation or in a situation that, that makes you feel uncomfortable or sad or whatever it might be or depressed. You go, okay, that's the real and there's also something meaningful in this. There's something to learn, there's a purpose to it and that it will ultimately enable me to serve in mm. some way. That, all, that resilience is in, in our view, and, and in, again, just having done this work for a long, long time, um, humbly, I'll, I'll say that resilience is not about how we endure. It's about, it's about how we are able to recharge our batteries and how we are able to come back and are able to use whatever it is that, that we've experienced for, the, for a greater purpose, for, for the benefit of others. I mean, you're able yeah. to make something out of it. Mm -hmm. And that whole concept of making sort of the lemonade out of the lemons is, is a reframe. So that's the first component is to reframe. The second component, component is to be able to recalculate, to be able to look at any place that you are on the map and go, okay, well, so I'm in the weeds, right? I found myself in this ditch somehow. Um, but I was headed toward the, the, the city of Oz, you know? I was like, I'm on the, the yellow brick road, and the next thing you know, the flying monkeys and, and every other crazy thing, and the witch, you know, drove me off into the ditch. And go, well, can I still get to Oz? And, you know, we, we know, obviously, the story is that Dorothy gets to Oz, but she didn't have a GPS. She followed her heart, and she followed... The, the guidance of the people that also were, you know, were, were there with her on that journey. And, and so we have a GPS. It's an internal GPS, just like in our cars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if, if we run into, you know, off the, the path with our, our car, our, our GPS will say to us, you know, how to, to go from exactly where we are to exactly where we want to go. Our GPS never, never talks to us like, you idiot, you dummy. I can't, I can't believe you did that. You made a left. I told you to make a right. 
Maybe it's, it should. It should. It's, it's just like your mother said. You yeah. can't follow directions. Like, is that what our GPS <laughs> says? No, it, we got like a nice British accent. <laughs> right, right then. Just make yeah. a ride here. Yeah, you know? you're, exactly. you're a, Be a good lad. You know, yeah. it's, it's, like, it's all good. Yeah. There's no issue. It just, it just says recalculating. Right. That's what the GPS says, recalculating. And so that's part two or the second trait that resilient people are, are they're serial pivoters. They know yeah. how to recalculate. They just recalculate like it's a part of the whole game. Well, I feel like you're taking a lot of like the emo kind of the emotion out of it or like the, the import out of it. It doesn't have to be like a level 10 crisis. It's just like, okay, you know, just like the GPS, you're just going to take a different turn. And that's where some creativity comes into play. And like you said, the more we get out of that monkey mind and spin and into the center, into that internal sense of knowing whether you feel guided by it from God or higher power or universe or just that gut feel, like knowing that is everything. Just let all those emotions kind of diffuse. Totally. And, and so the, you recalculate and the last part is, is the one we talked about earlier, which is that you have to create rituals for recovery. Because you, mm. you will not be able to perform at the level that you have been given the cap capacity to perform at, perform at if your capacity is totally drained, if your battery is drained. We plug our phones in and plug our devices in obsessively, obsessively, because we yeah. know that the last thing we want is for that screen to go dark. And now we can't make a phone call. Or we can't check our email. We can't check our Facebook or whatever other obsessive compulsive behaviors we have regarding our technology. So, but it's so different with ourselves. We let our batteries drain down and we pay no attention to those things really. And we don't have a meter that says we're going to go dark until we actually go dark. Mm -hmm. And by dark, we know what that looks like. For all of us, it's different. Um, and some it's physical, some it's mental, some it's emotional, and, 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 and all the rest. So um, the rituals that we have, that we create, these conscious new habits that we create to recharge our battery so that we can be at our best, so that we can be at our highest capacity, the way we would if we had an Olympic event tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If you had an Olympic event tomorrow, if, if I did, we know what kind of sleep we would be getting, how we would be drinking water, how we would be resting and, and, and not just resting because a part of performing great is that we put ourselves under a certain amount of stress and strain and then we, and then we take our foot off our necks. You know, yeah. we, we give ourselves the time to recover. I was a lifeguard for a lot of years and, and one of my great resilience lessons and, and experiences was in on that lifeguard stand mm -hmm. where we we had thousands of people that we were responsible for i don't mean a pool lifeguard not that that's not a hard job it was just we worked at a beach i worked at a beach and we were making hundreds of rescues on a saturday or sunday we had hundred thousand people on the beach and mm -hmm. and and when the waves were big and the rip currents were strong we were constantly in that water in life and death situations and mm -hmm. so we didn't work for eight hours straight with the sun glare and the wind and, and the, all the chaos on the beach of people that were sometimes drunk and sometimes fighting and sometimes OD and sometimes people having, having uh, you know, uh, sunstroke and, and every imaginable thing. We would work in the stand for an hour and be super focused and, and be at our very, uh, like Olympic, not just Olympic, gold medal performance in that lifeguard stand for an hour. Yeah, and then we would come down off the stand and another lifeguard would get in the stand or another two guards would come in, two would come down and we would eat our lunch. We would close our eyes. We would relax. We'd walk around the beach looking at girls. We'd go in the weight shack and lift weights. I mean, we would take great care of ourselves yeah. on that on that down hour. And then we'd get back up in the stand an hour later and we would rock and roll. And mm -hmm. for seven summers that I was on that beach, we did not lose anybody. Mm-hmm. And, fantastic right and it was an impeccable record of performance and that's in in many ways to be resilient what we're talking about is how you are able to be your absolute best with full yeah. capacity full battery so that you can deal with your your kids when they're being obstreperous or your boss when that He's, person is being a pain in the neck you know or whatever or when yeah or when your <laughs> digital marketing 
is not working or when Amazon decides to cut you off or any of the million things that go on in a day, mm -hmm. they just throw you into the ditch. Mm -hmm. exactly. You got to be your best to deal with that crap. Right. Well, and I love your lifeguard stories and analogy. You know, my husband was a lifeguard too. Is that right? Um, yeah. Narragansett State Beach in Rhode Island. Holy for, smokes. Yeah. So we have to get together some night, all of us. So, but he's got it's some, in the cards. He's got some stories too. But one thing that he's talked about, and I see him because we, we go to the beach with the family, go, he gets out in the water, we surf, but his eye is still constantly scanning and he'll be right there just in a moment's notice if he felt he needed to. But one thing he's always mentioned, same thing, never lost anyone. But it's because they weren't in the business of rescues, they were in the business of prevention. Prevention. So, yeah, so you're preventing burnout, you know, in the same analogy by just taking care of yourself before you get there, like before you're headed for that, whatever that, you know, crisis might be, you're taking care of yourself first. You're taking those breaks, you're, you're in that ritual. You're in that, like, I'm going to do this because I know I need it for me. And I know, I don't know about for men. I know women especially talk about feeling guilty. They feel guilty taking care of themselves. Oh, so yeah. do you have any thoughts as a man, you know, coming from that other side, Venus and Mars, how do we get out of that feeling of guilt? And actually it's not just women. I mean, I know men can feel like this too. So if you're someone who is like, I can't, I just can't, I feel guilty. What do you say? Wow. I'm just taking notes on something you said before, because that was just so wonderful to hear you reflect it back the way you did about your yeah. husband's experience, right? Because mm -hmm. it was totally prevention. We, we were creating resilience before we needed it. And I think right. that I really want folks to, to know that the, you, you create the muscles of resilience before they're going to be, before they'll be Precisely. called into action. Yeah. Precisely. And, and for, for Randy and I, um, a part of, what our early experience in marriage was, I mean, we're married now. It'll be 31 years this summer. So Congratulations. It's just amazing. Yeah. yeah. And that, and, and it, you know, it's like a blink of an eye and that happens, right? But yeah. at the beginning, I used to sneak off and go to the pool to swim to take care of myself. And I would lie about it because I would say, I'd say to her, and this could be a Saturday or a Sunday because I was, you know, a lawyer all week long and whatnot. And then I'd say, well, I'll go out, I'll go shopping. And uh -huh. so I'm going to do my part. I'm going to go to food town and I'm going to pick up the shop. And it would be two hours before I get home. And she <laughs> said to me, shopping took you two hours. Like, seriously, <laughs> what the heck have you been doing? And I'm like, oh, uh, you know, I went to the Y. I went swimming. Yeah. And I would routinely lie about it because I would feel this sense that, that I was being, I was being selfish. She didn't take that time for herself. So why, why should I? Right. And, and she and I, when we do relationship work, which, which we do sometimes, um, do workshops on that. We talk about this, this idea of, of loving yourself first, mm -hmm. that it is very important in a relationship that you don't, that you don't give up showing yourself care and love mm -hmm. because that enables you to show up as a better version of yourself, which is a sexier version is a hotter version for your spouse as opposed yeah. to the version of you that's depleted and complaining and whining and mm -hmm. needy and, you know, needy is like, neediness is like a virus. Nobody wants to catch that. Yeah. And nobody wants to be around it. Not mm -hmm. your, not any, not your spouse, not anybody or your partner. Um, so yeah, taking care of yourself is super important. I think, you know, millennials are more dialed into this than yeah. my generation. I'm a, I'm a, a, a Gen Xer. And um, I, I think we were still more perpetuating the habits that we saw from our parents that were more about sacrifice and right. martyrdom even i don't know um but the divorce rate being more than 50 percent it's not a good thing to follow that no. is not a good path to be on you you've got to each and i and i'm giving advice here i guess it, it's like self-care is something that you ritualize and and that's how you habitualize it and it's something that you you support each other to do exactly that's why you know randy and i when we could do it together like going to yoga freaking great but she doesn't like to surf she's not going to go out in the ocean so she will look at the ocean sometimes we live right where we can see it she'll say looks like a good day to go and like yeah. the surf looks good and and so she's telling me she's encouraging me hey why don't you go do that why don't you go for a swim she says that to me a lot lately she says to me you know you got a break in your calendar for another you know 90 minutes so can you, you want to go over and grab a swim i'm like I freaking love that 
Yes. Yeah, it's just supporting you to make it happen. Yeah, yeah I love that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. yeah, and I think it's a really important, you know, if you are with a partner or a spouse, just to have those conversations. And sometimes I think that guilt, it's more in our own heads. And it's funny because my husband, I, I can tell when he's gone surfing, even if he doesn't tell me, because he's still a little guilty. And I love it when he goes surfing. So he can yeah. let that go. It's clearly not about me. It's like he carries it again, latchkey kid, you know, parents divorce. I mean, all that stuff kind of rides with us but i i think the beauty of being married to me is like i'm here when he's ready to let that go but you can tell that the, there's a wetsuit hanging in the in the shower and it's wet i'm like yes he went out so i'll ask him about it but yeah. you know i just having someone to support you and if if you're not married or with a spouse or you're not quite there yet supporting yourself like as a, your best friend would as like that best version of yourself would just giving yourself that grace and permission it is a permission yeah. thing. When we when we'll share this message on a corporate stage, it mm. often is that that they don't feel the culture of the company is giving them permission to That's take time point. for themselves. So they feel shame around not getting the night owl award or right. working through the weekend when their mm. when their kids have got a thing that they'd rather be at. I mean, yeah. anyway, it's it's a big topic, but these three things to be able to reframe, mm-hmm. to be able to recalculate and to be able to recharge. These are the the key distinctions when when it comes to creating resilience. That's perfect. It's such gold. So, thank you so much. And we are going to start to wrap up here a little bit. And I just love to ask you like kind of if there's just one more thing you'd want to share with our listeners here, just about just staying motivated because, you know, we have these things to kind of re- recycle through, but if you ever get to a place where you're just like, whew, you know, anything you're just going to want to share, like last thoughts on just how to stay motivated through some of these, these ups and downs and changes. It would just be to go back to creating, creating some new rituals for yourself. Yeah. And to me, the, the, the way you begin the day is one of those classic things. It's the first mm-hmm. domino. So basic thing is start the day with, with something that will put the right seeds in the soil, the seeds that you'd, you'd put in the soil if you could go, oh yeah, that's, that's what I want to see grow today. Like nobody yeah. puts their feet on the floor. You know, even when I was a mi- really miserable <laughs> lawyer. I was in a lot of, I was in a lot of misery. I was in the right profession for it. I was in a, in a, in a profession that can feed on misery and charge, charge $800 an hour for it. Um, So uh, I still, even then didn't put my feet on the floor and go, I want to be a real SOB today. I want to be so angry and resentful, even though by three o'clock I was being angry and Mm. or I was angry earlier than that. Um, But I didn't, I wasn't setting an intention for that. It was my default mode. And we all have default modes. We have a default mode network in our brain that immediately kind of takes us off into some, some of those uh, you know, fight or flight responses to things. So the way you begin the day um, is, is, is to me the most powerful thing. And, and I take 10 seconds at the start of the day every day to, to say something out loud that I, I want to believe. Um, when I started saying it, I don't think I, I believed it about every part of my life. And, and now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm 90% there. No, I, I still, right. you know, have areas that, that I, I don't love and, and uh, even loathe. So to be honest, there are, there are just mm-hmm. parts when I find myself reacting to certain things. I go, wow, that part of me, that little, that little monkey is still there, you know? Um, but I say these four words at the start of every day. I love my life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when I did that TED talk and I, and I disclosed that those are my words, that's my, that's my ritual. There were a lot of, it was a lot of support. A lot of people loved it. And there were people that were like, screw you, man. Like if you knew what my life was like or where yeah. I lived in the world, you wouldn't, you wouldn't dare, uh, think that 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 would be a, something I could do. And I'll, I engage with some of those people, but, but mostly um, I, just, I just held space for the fact that not everybody's ready to, and it's a steep gradient. That's why I say I didn't, I didn't really um, fully embrace that statement when I started stay, saying it, 
but that mm-hmm. I, that I am, I want to be in love with my life. I want to be in love with life. And so I love my life starts my day every day with the most powerful intention for that day. And that's when you ask, you know, what's one, one simple thing people can do, just create that powerful intention in the form of a statement that you say, and, and that you give yourself permission to say it and that you're kind and gentle with yourself. If you don't believe it fully at the moment and over time, um, persistence and, and these tiny little changes over time, they produce a compound effect that is breathtaking, but you got, but you have to stick with it. Mm-hmm. So on the motivation side, um, you can't, you can't go back to something we said earlier. You can't build something and then wreck it in the next minute. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, building a sandcastle and then just taking your foot and, and wiping it all away. It's uh, that's sabotage. Frustra- it's sabotage. It's frustrating. Yeah. It's exhausting. Well, a couple of thoughts I just been thinking about with that is one, you know, some, I talk to people who maybe have trouble meditating or they don't feel like they have enough time to. And what you're saying is great because you can literally just take 10 seconds in the morning and shift your day by saying one sentence. And, and I, I, I know what you're saying. If it sounds too powerful or it sounds too distant to say something like, I love my life or to say something like, I love myself. And one little tweak I might just offer is to, to say like, I I'm a commitment to loving my life. I'm a commitment to, and you can say it like, I love my life because it's an intention. It's something that it doesn't have to be perfect. doesn't have to be 100%, but I have that intention. So by the same token, we can say like, if it's too much, you know, for those people who maybe are like, Ugh, can I do that? Could I really say that? Like just saying, I am, I am a commitment to just to mm-hmm. feel into that. And And also the second piece I want to add on is if it feels overwhelming that, oh my gosh, I'm just going to keep doing this and like what's going to happen to make a quest, to make a quest for the next five days to get up 20 minutes earlier and have your cup of coffee, look at the the trees outside, say your thing to yourself just for five days or 21 days, maybe do it for 90 days. Just like have, have, make it a little bit of a game, like make, make it a quest so it doesn't feel just like into oblivion, I'm going to do this and maybe something will happen. And you're right. If you can gamify it for yourself, it's a, it's a good thing. Um, yeah, it's consistency. I mean, yeah. it, it's not, it may be not the sexiest thing. I'm, 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 I'm less about the days these now only because in looking into how habits are created and, and, and where they become habits versus something we do for a season. Um, a lot of it has to do just with the consistency. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You, can, you can create something in a short amount of time, um, but, but it, it starts with wanting, you know, first of all, wanting a change, that mm-hmm. awareness, as we said, and then a micro step, a little baby step, like I am, and I love that one. I am a commitment to loving my life. What a yeah. There's, you know, you're in the th- in three feet of water instead of 10. Exactly. And then you yeah. can get into that wearing this t-shirt, I love my life. Yeah. yeah. Well, I am just so thrilled to have had you on here and have this conversation like this. And for people who are listening or watching, how can they get in touch with you? I mean, you have so much to offer with your podcast and with helping people to be on um, a, their do a TEDx or talks and your website. So tell us how yeah, they go find to you. AdamMarkel.com. That's the, the, you know, the simplest way we have Facebook pages, uh, a group called start my pivot on Facebook. Um, and the Adam Markel site will give the podcast. It's right there as well as um, some really cool online tools and uh, some digital uh, di- digital workshops we do as well as speaker training. So all that's at AdamMarkel.com. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, I've been so glad to have you. And I, I just, I love our takeaways about, you know, reframing, recalculating, which is very creative in these rituals for recovery. And I just love to know from anyone who's out there listening, what your rituals are going to be as well coming off of our talk. Well, thanks so much, Adam. Thank you, Stephanie. I'll see you. Yeah. Likewise. I'll see you back on the mat. Yeah. I can't wait for Thursday. <laughs> I know, me too. <laughs> Thursday, I got a good new playlist coming for us. <laughs> way cool. All Thank right. You. Thank you.